Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the American Center at the U.S. Embassy. It's a distinct pleasure to see you all here. And it's an honor for us to welcome our distinguished guests, who are experts in the area of sustainable development in the Arctic. And it's my honor to welcome, to introduce my colleague, Daniel Ross, who is who serves as the counselor for environment, science, technology, and health here in the embassy. He will take a few moments to introduce uh, each member of our panel and also uh, speak about his work here at the embassy in supporting international scientific cooperation on Arctic issues. Please join me in welcoming Daniel and the rest of the members of our panel today. Um, Maja was very generous in saying that we're, we're all um, experts in sustainable development because while these men are experts, I am actually not. Um, I'm just uh, a career diplomat with the U.S. Foreign Service and um, it's, it's been my pleasure over the past three years to have the opportunity to work on environment and science and health issues here in Russia. Um, and in particular, the, the most interesting and rewarding area has been the, the Arctic issues. Um, and uh, I, I think I will first just talk very briefly about um, the U.S. Embassy's role uh, before I introduce the actual experts uh, who can give you a much more substantive view of uh, issues in the Arctic. Um, here in the U.S. Embassy, um, We've basically been supporting, um, over the last two years, the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, the U.S. took over chairmanship of the Council in uh, April of 2015 from Canada. And we had a fairly ambitious agenda with three main priorities. And those priorities were um, addressing the effects of climate change in the Arctic, um, addressing the issue of oceans management in the Arctic. That was of particular interest of former Secretary of State John Kerry. Um, and then uh, socioeconomic development for uh, inhabitants of the Arctic region. And um, various uh, projects were undertaken in each of these areas. But the main, um, the main focus of the two years that the US was chair of the council um, was negotiating an agreement on scientific cooperation in the Arctic region. Um, and that agreement was actually just signed at the ministerial that took place in May in Fairbanks, Alaska. And it was at that ministerial that the United States turned over the chairmanship of the council to Finland, which will be the chair of the council for the next two, two years. And it's our understanding that um, the Finnish chair plans to continue on with a lot of the same programs that began under the U.S. chairmanship. So the focus will, will remain on um, climate change and environmental issues and socioeconomic development in the Arctic region. Um, so with that, I think I will uh, now introduce to you um, the members of our panel. Um, the first member is uh, Professor Paul Berkman, who is Professor of, Practi of Practice in Science Diplomacy and the Acting Director of the Science Diplomacy Center at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy um, at Tufts University in the US. Uh, then we have Professor Oren Young, who is Professor Emeritus at the Marin School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California in Santa Barbara in the United States. Uh, and then we have um, Professor Anna Alexander and I'm going to try to say your last name. Will. 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 What he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, who is the head of the international law program at uh, M. Gimal University here in Moscow. Uh, and next to him, we have Professor Fraser Taylor, who is the Chancellor's Distinguished Research Professor of International Affairs 
Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And then finally, we have Professor um, Peter Pulsifer, uh, who is a research scientist and chair of the Arctic Data Committee uh, at the National Snow and Ice Data Center at the University of Colorado in the United States. So um, we're very happy to have such experts, such a distinguished panel here. And I'll just mention that um, we're very fortunate to have all of them here because they are here uh, on having a meeting of the Pan-Arctic Options Organization, which is basically um, exactly the type of scientific cooperative effort that the agreement that the Arctic Council has just signed on scientific cooperation is hoping to augment and, um, and facilitate. So the, the, the meeting that they're having and the discussions they're, they're having here in Moscow right now are the type of cooperation that we hope to see happening among um, Arctic states in the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Perkman. Thank you, Daniel. I'd like to uh, thank the American Center and the U.S. Embassy for the opportunity for the Antarctic Options Project to share information, ideas, insights with you. Um, the Antarctic Options Project is a five-year project funded through a program called the Belmont Forum. Uh, the collaborators in the project involve the United States, Canada, France, Norway, Russia, and China. Um, and the intention is to think in international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive manner. Um, to think across generations, so not just in terms of security timescales, but to think in terms of solutions that would operate across the 21st century and well beyond, to think in terms of balance uh, between economic prosperity, environmental protection, societal well-being, and importantly, to think in terms of promoting cooperation and preventing conflict, to think in ways that balance national interests and common interests. Daniel mentioned the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and so uh, perhaps in terms of setting the stage for this discussion, the Arctic Council was established in 1996 uh, by the eight Arctic states, uh, which include the United States and Russia, Canada, Denmark, uh, Norway, Iceland, Finland, and Sweden, plus the six indigenous peoples organizations. And they established this Arctic Council after the, after the, after the Cold War, um, largely emerged from a thought that was introduced in 19. 87 by Mikhail Gorbachev, um, where he suggested the concept of an Arctic Research Council became the Arctic Council. Uh, the Arctic Council began with 1996, um, and every two years there would be a, a ministerial meeting. And from 1996 to about 2009, the ministerial meeting was held by mid level diplomats from the various foreign ministries of the eight Arctic states. In 2009, the ministerial meeting moved to the level of the foreign ministers of the Arctic states. Um, and at that point, in 2009, was the first Arctic Council declaration, ministerial declaration, to introduce the term peace. So when the Arctic Council was established, they talked about common Arctic issues. They identified sustainable development and environmental protection as common Arctic issues. But it wasn't until the meetings began at the level of foreign ministers that the concept of peace was actually introduced into the declarations of the Arctic Council. And if you think about terms that exist in foreign policy, probably the most complicated and difficult term to use is the word peace itself. In 2011, again, building on the cooperation at the level of foreign ministers, in 2011, a binding agreement was signed on search and rescue, uh, recognizing that there was now an opening Arctic Ocean, a new ocean at the, at the North Polar region, uh, with opportunities for shipping and energy activities, fishing. Um, with that, in 2013, another binding agreement was signed dealing with marine oil pollution preparedness response. And this year, as Daniel mentioned, the eight Arctic states, plus the foreign ministers of Greenland and Faroe Islands, signed an agreement, a binding agreement, on uh, 
international Arctic scientific cooperation. And the intention was to enhance scientific cooperation. It wasn't something that was to begin. And so this is the context in which um, we, as a, as a team, uh, came to share in, insights and, and perspectives with you. Um, to, to think in terms of uh, hope and inspiration, to think in terms of balance uh, between national interests and common interests, to think in terms of promoting cooperation, preventing conflict, and to recognize that the Arctic as a region on Earth is now being exposed to tremendous change. It is a region where there is an amplified response to climate. It's warming twice as fast as elsewhere on the Earth. More than half of the Arctic Ocean is now open water during the summer, um, allowing for ships to travel from the North Atlantic to the North Pacific uh, through open water, um, effectively without ice encumbrance during, during specific years. And the ice is continuing to retreat. And so this agreement that was signed in May of 2017 is intended to facilitate and enhance the type of scientific cooperation to think in terms of, of the types of data, access to research areas, access to research facilities, because this type of information is necessary for nations to understand not only the impacts, and issues, and the resources, but to think in terms of the solutions, the responses, the solutions and these responses are things that require time. They require perspective across time and space. And if we think about time and space, one of the areas that this, this agreement reflects is very similar to other agreements. There's an agreement in outer space, and there's an agreement in the Antarctic. And these three regions, the Arctic, the Antarctic, and outer space, effectively have been regions of cooperation between the United States and Russia, independent of the political challenges that exist elsewhere in the world. And the reason for this cooperation, the reason that the Antarctic, the Arctic, and outer space have been regions of cooperation is because science has been used as a tool of diplomacy. Science has enabled these nations to build common interests. And so with that as a preface, I'd like to introduce my colleagues give the floor to Professor Oren Young, who will share additional perspectives on the, on the agreement. The intention here is to, for us to introduce ideas, but most of the time here is to make available for you to ask questions and for us to have the dialogue. Well, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to focus specifically on this agreement um, on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation. And I want to develop two points uh, in my brief comment, comments here. The first is that this agreement is not the only uh, effort to um, enhance international cooperation regarding Arctic science. We can think of at least three different channels where such efforts have been made or are being made. <coughs> the first one uh, is through something called the International Arctic Science Committee, uh, which was formed in 1990. And this is an organization which is a non-governmental organization. The members are uh, National Academies of Science. Uh, and it, is, uh, it has 23 members now, so it's not restricted to the Arctic states themselves. The International Arctic Science Committee continues to be a very active player in this, uh, in this effort. So that's one channel. The uh, second channel is opened up through meetings of um, national ministers of science and research and education. Uh, there was a meeting in 2015 in Washington uh, which is actually not part of the American Chairmanship of the Arctic Council, but brought together <coughs> about 25 ministers of science and research focusing on Arctic issues. So this was an intergovernmental meeting, but not limited only to the Arctic countries. And then the third channel is the agreement which has just been signed uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, where 
this and the, and the governmental agreement, uh, but limited to the Arctic states in terms of signatory. So the question I pose to you is, what is the meaning of having these multiple channels? Uh, is this a situation where we can expect synergy so that the interaction of these several different channels will lead to a situation in which the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? Or is this a situation where these different channels are perhaps uh, serving somewhat different communities and somewhat different interests so that there will be a challenge to figure out how to mesh these different channels of initiative to get the best results in terms of scientific cooperation. That's my first point. Uh, the second point I want to develop for you is uh, around the following issue. Those of us who think about international cooperation in general, not just about scientific cooperation, but about any scientific cooperation, uh, always think about how do we move from paper to practice. So we have a document signed that it will be a formal agreement. It's intended to be a legally binding agreement when it enters into force, but still it's a piece of paper. And so the question is, how do we breathe life into this? How do we make something real out of it? And I want to suggest to you the following thoughts. Uh, I do not think that the difficulties or complications relating to scientific cooperation that I could give anything to do with politics or policy. Those, I think, are not really the central issues, but I think there are four key factors that um, will really um, determine the outcome in this respect. The first one has to do with uh, human relations. It has to do with real relations science and networking with each other. Meeting each other. I remember forming uh, we had a large conference in 1988 for Leningrad, then I remember Leningrad, um, and it had five or six hundred people, the majority of whom were actually Russian scientists. Many of them were meeting each other for the first time. It was an amazing experience to say these guys were working on somewhat similar things, forming personal relationships. And those of us who were coming internationally formed personal relationships a number of which continue to this day to be important to the avenues of communication. I led a, an American team of social scientists uh, in 1993 who had a workshop, a joint workshop, with a set of counterparts from Russia under the auspices of the then Soviet Academy of Women, the Russian Academy of Sciences in those days. And we had about 25 people. And out of that meeting, in a week's time, we forged some relationships which led to significant research projects, books being published, continuing relationships. So this human relationships, I think, is absolutely critical to make the move from paper to practice. There are also questions of scientific culture. We have different scientific cultures in our different uh, countries. For example, in Russia, a lot of the scientific research is carried out by people who are located in institutes of the Russian Academy of Sciences, rather than people who are located in universities. Whereas in America, and I think in Canada and some other countries, a lot of the research is carried out by people operating in university settings. These are somewhat different cultures, and we have to learn how to communicate across these different positions and then, of course, thirdly, there is the issue of bureaucracy, science bureaucracy. You know, we all experience within our own individual countries the complications and the time-consuming efforts that are involved in moving from a, um, a call for research proposals, which we submit our proposals to, to actually getting the money and hiring the people and starting to do things like we're doing with the Anarchy Options Project. So that's true in every individual country, but when we now say we have, we have parallel bureaucracies in each of the countries, it's that much more difficult to mesh 
a different sort of bureaucratic processes. And then I think finally and fourthly, there's an issue of uh, the security or the dependability uh, of support for uh, Arctic uh, scientific research. I mean, we, you are familiar from a Russian point of view with what happened to scientific support uh, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, where there was a period of time when the Russian Academy of Sciences was frankly uh, without funding. Um, we in the United States are now moving into a period in which we are feeling much less certainty with respect to expectations that we may have regarding what our new administration will feel is an appropriate level of support for science. So this, the dependability of the security of the, of the material support is, I think, a very sort of critical question in moving from paper to practice. So we celebrate this agreement, signed in Fairbanks a couple of weeks ago, but we are conscious of the various kinds of issues that we have to work hard and continuously to address and to overcome to make the move from the paper to practice. And I would like to uh, invite everybody here and everybody you know to become active participants in making that happen. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, one Arctic option project is a multidisciplinary project, as my colleagues have already indicated. And, uh, of course, the important component of this project is uh, research of applicable international law. And uh, Arctic as an object of international law, of course, is uh, the focus of this project. It is really a unique object of international law because, as you know, on the one hand, uh, the first international treaties which are applicable to the Arctic are of the 19th century. For instance, the Russian Empire and Great Britain concluded the Convention of 1825, uh, which is the first international document of such kind, the delimiting Arctic spaces. Uh, the Convention between Russia and the United States of 1867 was really a very, a very great event, just to mention. There was no a single protest either in relation to the first convention or to the second convention, which is really very important. Or, for instance, the Treaty of Spitsbergen of 1920, to which all practically all Arctic states are parties, which is really very important document and uh, which uh, I, I would say which gives some political stability and legal stability in the Arctic region. So uh, the agreement, for instance, between five Arctic coastal states of 1973 uh, on the polar bear, uh, the United States, at that period of time, Soviet Union, something I thought that as a professor, a very loud voice. In any case, uh, and the agreement of 1973 on the whole of the bear uh, between five Arctic coastal states, United States, Soviet Union at that period of time, Norway, Denmark, and uh, of course Canada, uh, I would say that was really a, a very successful international instrument which has showed that even in the period of Cold War, preparation is possible in the Arctic. So, um, of course, the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, influenced the regional uh, legal regime of the Arctic, uh, just providing some general guidance. Of course, it's of great importance, and uh, there is no problem that uh, this country, this Arctic country, participate formally in this treaty, that not, because every Arctic state admits that this convention provides for customary rules of international law, which are obligatory to all Arctic states in any case, with the exception, of course, of part 11, that is about 
Iran is which is common heritage in landscape, and this uh, part is really very new, and uh, not, uh, no other uh, Geneva Maritime Conventions uh, provide for such very new, very unusual mechanism, and probably even take into account the consequent agreement on the implementation of this part, I mean the agreement of 1994. Still, uh, I believe that uh, the Unit Loss Convention, as far as application to the Arctic, needs to be, to be taken uh, with cautiousness. And as you know, the Lunisat Declaration of the five Arctic coastal states of uh, 2008 underlines that a broad international legal place is applicable to the Arctic, but the declaration does not specifically mention the clause because of obvious reasons. Because not all Arctic uh, coastal states participate in this convention. So I believe that this uh, international legal stability in the Arctic is really a great advantage. On the other hand, as we could see, this international legal basis is not static. It is always developing. It is developing on universal level, on the regional level, on bilateral level, and even uh, what we call soft law documents, like declarations which are adopted by the African Council. So uh, it's, it's really a very good advantage that you have such international project, an active project, which I believe the, uh, the unique characteristic that it is multidisciplinary is, is really very important. Thank you. Yeah, here. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to participate in this panel discussion. I'm going to talk about what is Article 9 in the agreement, which deals with indigenous peoples in the country and all of the Arctic states. Now, let me start. Uh, Paul has made a point of how rapidly things are changing in the Arctic, much more rapidly than many other parts of the world. I'm going to start with a joke. A hen and a pig are walking down the road, and they see a sign for a restaurant serving bacon and eggs. The hen puffs out her chest and says, I'm involved in that. And the pig says, Madam, you may be involved, but I'm committed. <laughs> in many ways, whatever we do in research terms has to take cognizance of the importance of the knowledge of local peoples. Now, obviously, they come from different cultural environments different histories, different experiences, but all have a rich sense of knowledge, which has been developed over centuries. And if you're talking about sustainability, these societies have sustained themselves in the face of rapid change of all kinds over a very long period of time, and probably will continue to do so. Now, indigenous knowledge is not a static thing. It's a dramatic and dynamic thing, which is changing all of the time. And the kind of research that I'm involved with, and also my colleague Peter, involves trying to understand how to take the rich knowledge of indigenous peoples and the Western scientific hard knowledge and try to bring them closer together so that one informs the other in meaningful ways. We're dealing with what, in fact, are two very different ontologies. The ontologies of indigenous people are not see persons as part of the environment, not a separate thing in terms of um, understanding. They're an integral part of the environment. So the ontology which comes from people like the Inuit, whom I deal with all the time, is quite different from the ontology of the Western scientist. And I think it behoves us, first, to listen, secondly, to respond, and thirdly, to make a special effort to merge 
two different kinds of knowledge of the same sets of issues so that we can learn from each other and in the process of learning from each other hopefully arrive at better understandings and by definition better solutions for the mitigation of the challenges that are uh, facing people these days. So I'm making a plea for the importance of bottom-up uh, indigenous knowledge and trying to ensure that the top-down knowledge from the Western scientists in fact don't clash but in fact cooperate and merge. As a minimum we can perhaps make these knowledge bases interoperable. I'm not sure we can integrate them in, in, in totality but we can certainly do a lot better than we have been doing in terms of listening. Western science comes from a particular paradigm. That paradigm is an old one and a valuable one, but it is not the only paradigm when we come to deal with Arctic knowledge and knowledge of Arctic peoples. And I think that is an area which uh, the Fairbanks uh, Declaration has pointed out and which within the Pan-Arctic Options Interdisciplinary Framework, um, I and my colleagues hopefully will make um, a contribution to this, uh, to this important process of knowledge building. Thank you, Fraser, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'll just add briefly to what Professor Taylor has said. Um, we do have, um, we are working to engage directly with indigenous people and their organizations in this project, but there are still impediments. There are still issues, as Oren's pointed to, practical issues um, in relation to funding, in relation to access, and so on, that actually prevent us from having an indigenous person sitting here with us. So that's something as we work through this project and many others, and the Arctic Council continues, um, those issues need to be addressed. And I think there's some progress being made, but there's still a lot of work to do in that area. So. Uh, I'm going to speak more directly to uh, data, information, and knowledge. So a component of the statement um, of cooperation, scientific cooperation, focuses on data sharing. Um, science is really about, and, and many forms of science, whether we're talking about Western science, whether we're talking about the development of indigenous knowledge, it's really about uh, curiosity, it's about creativity, it's about observation, and bringing those things together to help us to better understand our world. When we take those observations and those insights and we store them in some way that they can be communicated, whether that be in digital objects or whether that be through oral tradition, etc., it allows us to share. And the sharing is critically important. And it's, it's really not just important now, but it's very urgent that we're able to take the results of this research and share it broadly, not only within a country, but amongst uh, all of the countries of the Arctic and beyond, all of the countries of the world. And that, in that way, collectively, we can bring together you know, our minds, our, our creativity, et cetera, to help us to look at the change that's happening and better understand it. Um, this is critically important also in, in experimental sciences in terms of reproducibility, the ability for anybody to take the results of another researcher and reproduce them and say, yes, I agree with those, or no, in fact, I get a different result, so we need to continue the conversation around that. So this is why the, the data aspect, the data information and knowledge that's generated is really an important part of the scientific cooperation. What we're seeing now is a, a large movement toward what we're calling open data. And I think that's critically important for us moving forward. The that we make the information and data available openly and freely with minimal or no cost, or, or maybe just the cost of reproduction and distribution, but not um, on a profit basis, so that people from all countries, from all areas can access these data. Um, part of that is not just making it available, but it's making it available in a timely fashion. So we need to make sure it's available um, soon enough to address their needs. Um, making it available in 20 or 30 years is not going to be appropriate for the types of change that we're seeing now. So that's a critical part of it. Another aspect of this is um, in, in an increasingly digital world where data are being stored digitally, we need to be able to make sure that the systems that operate for these data can work together. And we call that interoperability, or this ability for the system to share. So that's going to be a combination of working together as a world community 
to establish um, common understandings, common standards, etc., but also developing tools so that when the common understandings and, and uh, standards maybe can't be achieved easily, those tools can maybe help to mediate or to translate uh, across those, and, and Fraser um, alluded to that. If it's not a perfect integration, at least we can bring them together. So that's critically important, I think. We have a number of great opportunities now. Um, Oren mentioned the International Arctic Science Committee, or IASC, is another group called SEAM, Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks. They now have a data committee that is an international body trying to focus on these issues, working with issues like uh, the Geocold Regions Initiative as well, which is more of an international body. Um, a number of now funded national and regional projects that actually have resources to start putting towards these projects. So they're really starting to make some real difference in this field. Um, we need to remember, though, that we're not just doing this for posterity or simply for the sake of, of sharing data. It's to what end. So to what end, we have to think about the different users. So there are going to be certainly scientific users. We also think about the policy community. We have to think about local communities, but also industry, search and rescue, and all kinds of other operations. So all of that needs to be considered. And then to what end in terms of focusing on things like sustainability. So we have to think, you know, what are we doing this for? Why is it important? Um, it may seem like a very technical thing, and so nerds like myself and some others, uh, you know, in our meeting, we, we focus on this, but I think it's a really fundamental and integral part of this whole discussion we're having around the Arctic and around sustainability. Thank you. So we'd like to open it up to questions. That was the primary reason for this interaction. Hi, uh, I'm a student exchange student now studying in the market more and uh, I would love to know like we know in the Arctic there are rich resources like gas, oil, like that. I wonder now in the future do you think they will explore those resources? I started coming to meetings um, to a large extent in Russia in 2009-10 time period, and uh, there are four international Arctic forums that have been convened by uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, initially by the Russian Geographic Society, and most recently through Ross Congress. And in each of those meetings, uh, it was clear from the Russian perspective that the economic future of Russia is in the Arctic. Um, and that involves certainly energy, oil, and gas. It would involve shipping. It would involve fisheries, but resources, living and non-living. Um, a part of all of the Arctic states, um, economic prosperity for the indigenous peoples, for the nations, for the residents, is an important common interest. So the challenge is one of using the resources, extracting the resources in a way that is uh, doesn't damage the ecosystems that the nations also depend on, that the residents also depend on. So to, the simple answer to your question is yes, those resources will be used, are being used, um, and the challenge is to think in terms of, of how to explore as well as exploit those resources in a manner that's sustainable. Um, just as a note, the uh, there was a, there's a group called the World Economic Forum, and out of the World Economic Forum came a discussion that over a trillion dollars of investment is anticipated in the Arctic over the next two decades. And I would argue that the challenge is to use the investment that's anticipated over the next two decades and to turn it into sustainability across the next century. So the real risk that the Arctic faces today is more than the environmental state change. It's more than the opening of the Arctic Ocean. The real risk that the Arctic faces today is unplanned investment over the next two decades. But I'll leave, I'll leave it to others to answer question of resources. Or, um, maybe I can say a word or two about that. Um, <clears throat> I think we don't know the answer to your question. It will depend on at least technological, economic, and political factors. The technology is probably already sufficient to allow for the development of Arctic oil and gas in particular, which by some estimates may be as much as 30% of the remaining undiscovered 
hydrocarbons on the planet. But um, what about the economics and what about the politics? Um, at the current stage, um, the world market prices for oil and gas, Arctic, large scale Arctic development looks very marginal. So the question then is, what about the future? What can we expect in the longer run with respect to the world market prices for these resources? That will depend in very significant part on public policy. If, for example, there is a very major effort to make a transition to non-fossil fuel energy sources, as we move dramatically toward renewables, it's perfectly possible that some of those hydrocarbons will stay in the ground, will never be developed. But on the other hand, as we know from recent news, um, it's not so clear whether we are about to make a significant transition with respect to alternative energy sources. And in that case, uh, those hydrocarbons may very well be developed in the not too distant future. So it's, it depends, the answer is it depends, and it depends on the technological, economic, and public policy uh, forces. <coughs> Other questions, please? Yes. Awesome. <coughs> uh, speaking of the resources, um, Arctic is very attractive from this point of view. And uh, each of uh, the countries would like to benefit from it. Yeah? Are you right? Uh, am I right? Uh, uh, the question is how can we balance uh, financial interests and political interests and common interests? And could we influence local uh, governments or companies? Uh, could we do this? I think that uh, these are critical questions yes. and there are no easy answers. So for example, sustainability, but sustainability for whom? Sometimes there are conflicting views of economic development in Arctic states. For example, to the Inuit, sea ice is an extension of the land and they live on both the sea ice and the land. To the companies who are interested in opening up the Arctic, sea ice is a barrier to navigation which has to be smashed through in order to improve the ability to extract resources in the north. Those are two conflicting ideas, two conflicting ways of looking at things. If I was asked to define the challenges of economic development in the Arctic these days, I would say it involves reducing the contradictions to manageable proportions. Well, uh, probably I should add that, of course, every state has national interests, which is a legit uh, situation. Of course, uh, sometimes the activity in one state might be in a competition with the activity, economic activity of another state that is also, also very natural. Uh, the thing is how to regulate the relations between the states, and the only uh, regulator today is international law. There is no other invention. So I believe that taking into account that Arctic was really an area of very good positive cooperation right now, and uh, we might see that uh, we, the future possibilities of utilizing the resources, whether resources of the high seas, for instance, whether uh, Arctic Ocean has a transportation resource, or whether oil and gas resources, for instance, between two neighboring Arctic states, which have a continental shelf and already like Russia and Norway, and there are very good legal tools <coughs> to regulate the expression of these transboundary oil and gas resources. And 
we do not have any so to speak uh, worry about uh, such things because the uh, annex two, for instance, to the treaty between Russia and all the Treaty of Two Zero is really uh, probably the best contemporary example how to manage transboundary oil and gas resources while paying strict attention to environmental considerations. Of course, it uh, is not yet operating. It takes some time to prepare administrative, technological, and other tools, but we do not think that they might be Let's take more questions. More questions. Other questions, please. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. I work for the uh, Russian Academy of Science, and my, my research is uh, climate and Arctic. And I also took part in the um, Arctic Council some project like uh, AMAP and uh, like SWEPA, if you if you uh, know. And but my question is more political. You know that we know all uh, that uh, President Trump now quit with the uh, uh, Paris Agreement, and he <laughs> doesn't like even uh, the word climate. And I know that my colleagues, they even changed the titles of the project, uh, remove the word climate to submit uh, for the financing. And so my question, will this decision will uh, influence the um, cooperation between countries in Arctic, in uh, science, I mean? Uh, and will be some more probably um, obstacles, or maybe it's not for the cooperation Russia in and um, uh, United States in area of Arctic, especially in the uh, sharing data, maybe support of the project mutual, uh, or maybe it will be more hard. I don't know. Thank you. So we had uh, before before coming here this afternoon had anticipated this, this question, um, not surprisingly. Um, I think in terms of the answer, if you're, if you're talking about climate, climate is a planetary scale process. So if we look at planetary scale processes, we have to think in terms of planetary scale dynamics. Um, so climate doesn't operate over political timescales climate operates over decades and centuries and millennia. And so in, in a sense, if we think over decades and centuries and millennia, um, and we think in terms of the implications of something like a global accord, um, one way of doing that in terms of science, so science is a study of change, whether it's the natural sciences, the social sciences, or indigenous knowledge, it's a study of change. And if we think about our civilization, planetary scale, the oldest calendars on Earth are about 6,000 years old. So that, say, is 60 centuries. And last century, the 20th century, one century, uh, we had the concept of world war. Now, this wasn't regional war. It wasn't a continental war. It was world war. And the notion of world, in a sense, is something that really only emerged in one century out of 60. So if you think of a lifespan, a lifespan being 60 years, one year out of 60 is like an infant. And so in a sense, as a civilization, a globally interconnected civilization, now <coughs> approaching 8 billion people on Earth, we're just in our infancy really in our infancy about how to manage issues, impacts, and resources on a planetary scale. Like infants, we cry about things, we bump into things, we make mistakes. Um, and there are two elements of an infant. One element of an infant is that it is the most vulnerable stage of a species life. So there is a risk at this stage of our development as a civilization globally interconnected civilization to mature beyond infancy. The other feature of an infant, which I would say is probably the more important issue, 
is that infants, when you look at them, offer hope. You see the future. You think about their maturity. And so, in a sense, part of the answer to your question is recognizing that things that happen over political timescales are just variability around the trend in terms of being able to solve long-term problems. And so, really, as a civilization, we're now just beginning to talk about climate on a planetary scale. It is, by definition, a planetary scale process. So Earth has a climate, Mars has an interconnected manner. And the <coughs> challenge really is to mature beyond this stage of our infancy. So while there is variability um, introduced by political responses, the solutions will need to operate across decades and centuries. And I would just note that if we think in terms of decades to centuries, the, and we look at the types of solutions that our civilization has that offer continuity from the present into the distant future, I can only think of two things that our civilization has that offer that type of continuity. One is science, where science, what we know today, is based on what we learned yesterday. And what we know today becomes the basis for what we will learn tomorrow. So science is an evolving platform of knowledge. And it offers continuity through time. The other source of continuity in our world is religion. And somehow, these two sources of, of, of influence, of continuity, are what will bring us from the present into the distant future. Let me be a little more direct in answering your question. Um, it, it, it's clear that these actions are going to be harmful. There's no question about it. On the other hand, um, they may not be as harmful as some of us fear that they'll be. It's certainly the case that the international science community is not going to dry up and blow away because of the actions or the statements of an American president. Uh, in point of fact, many participants in the international science community may feel more committed, more energetic because of this adverse um, action from a political leader. And it also may be the case, and this is something I think we need to really think about, that the Arctic may remain as a zone of peace and cooperation, uh, particularly across East and West, that while we have disagreements about the Paris Agreement, about um, Syria, about the Ukraine, whatever, um, the Arctic remains um, a highly cooperative uh, area. And all eight foreign ministers came to Fairbanks, Alaska two weeks ago. Uh, there was no indication of decline in willingness to engage cooperatively in the Arctic. So in a way, uh, the significance or the importance of the Arctic um, on a larger scale um, may actually grow rather than decrease as a consequence of the the, the sort of negative uh, developments that are occurring in other uh, other contexts. Uh, in addition, uh, Russia and the United States have a number of bilateral environmental agreements and have held that President Trump was going to, to terminate them. The policy is the same. These environmental agreements are really very important. And if we compare, for instance, our agreements related to the Bering Strait region, they are really very important because they, they cover not only environmental issues, but also issues relating to, uh, to contacts between Chukotka and Alaska, for instance. So I think that your concern is very legitimate, but I, I, I'm optimist. And I think that everything will be OK as far as environmental cooperation is concerned because there is no way to do otherwise. Russia and United States are neighbors. The uh, longest maritime boundary in the world 
peace between Russia and the United States in the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Strait and the Bering Sea. So, uh, on the other hand, the distance between the Big Diamond Island, Russia, and Little Diamond Island, United States, is less than two miles. So, we are neighbors and we are just obliged to the bird. I think the question is a very legitimate one. And I think the answer to the question is, it's not going to affect international scientific cooperation in a huge way. What it will affect, and I think Oren has uh, drawn attention to this, is the possibility that support for scientific research in the United States may suffer if, in fact, this happens. But I very much doubt it in Arctic terms, because none of the Arctic nations, including Canada, can act alone. We are neighbors, whether we like it or not. The only way that any kind of understanding of change and development in the Arctic can take place is through scientific cooperation. And I believe that a science-based <coughs> policy on evidence is the only way to go. Now, if scientists in the United States find that they're no longer getting the kind of support that uh, they have been getting so far, I very much suspect that the other nations will increase their involvement in Arctic science in order to counterbalance this. In terms of loss of data, as you probably know, already large amounts of environmental data have been duplicated in other servers in other countries and if the threat becomes real, I would not be in the least surprised to see uh, shared data sets uh, emerge in other areas. So I'm very optimistic in terms of uh, this. And the idea that the pronouncement of one <coughs> short-term <coughs> statement <coughs> by one <coughs> man can influence <coughs> Arctic uh, <coughs> scientific <coughs> cooperation <coughs> is perhaps overstated. Again, I'm optimistic. <coughs> I'll just try and submit the mic's actually on anymore. Okay. Just trying to address that, and I think some of the other questions asked. I think whether you're coming from the question of a particular international agreement, or whether you're coming from scientific research, or thinking about economic development, resource extraction, all of those things require an integrated observing, monitoring process and system if we're going to address these things in an informed way. Um, what we're seeing now is a, a real state change, I think, in how that's being done. 20 or 30 years ago, I think there were just a certain small number of actors or states that were involved in doing that in the Arctic. In the past decade, particularly since the International Polar Year, we're seeing that done at an international level. So although there's still a lot of work to be done on this integrated observing and monitoring system, we're now seeing investments from multiple different countries, regions, etc. So while, as Oren and others point out, this you know, can have some damaging effects, I don't think it will stop the cooperation and there are enough organization states, et cetera, recognizing um, what needs to be done and are moving forward with it. Other questions, please? Yes, Lane. Um, I recommend the Institute for World Economy and International Relations, Russian Academy of Sciences, and my question uh, would be, um, these days we are witnessing a new trend, like much more countries are being involved, um, regional states, Asian, European, non-Arctic European. And I would like to hear a little bit about your, like your reflections about uh, future possible roles of non-Arctic states in these cooperation partners, what are their roles, <coughs> responsibilities, possible actions, interests, what is the evolution and what might be the future trend. Thank so, you. So in the absence of a microphone, I'll, I'll project. Um, <coughs> the, one, of the, one of the features of the Arctic um, is it's a case study <coughs> for <coughs> challenges we place on the planet. So about 30% of the Earth's surface falls within the boundaries of nations. 
uh, collectively defined in terms of national interests. 70% of the Earth falls beyond the boundaries of nations and areas that are defined in terms of common interests. So arguably the challenge we face as a civilization is one of balancing national interests and common interests, recognizing that nations will always first and foremost consider their own national interests. In the Arctic, in the center of the Arctic, is a region that is explicitly beyond sovereign jurisdictions, the high seas under the, under the law of the sea. It's the convention on the high seas in 1958. This is a region that is separate from the sea floor. It is unambiguously and will remain a region that is international, <coughs> such a, a region of common interest. All of the nations that have rights and responsibilities in the ocean, which are every nation, have activities and, and interests effectively in the Arctic high seas. And so there is a region in the Arctic that is beyond sovereign jurisdictions that allows for nations to think in terms of their common interests. In addition, there are activities like science that allow nations to explore their common interests. The activities of the European Union, even though they're not an observer to the Arctic Council, even though they propose to become one, they are actively contributing research. They have spent hundreds of millions of euros of, on, on science in the Arctic. So in a sense, the science itself provides a way to build the common interests. So a first step before you can balance national interests and common interests is you first have, have to have common interests. So science provides a vehicle to build common interests, and it's independent of whether it's one nation, an Arctic nation, or a non-Arctic nation. So in a sense, the answer to your question is already the nations are exploring and operating in a sense of building those common interests using science. But I'll let others answer the question because I know they will be interested as well. Great. Thanks, Elena, for the question. Um, my response is that whether or not it ever made sense to think of the Arctic as a separate region of the world which could be managed or dealt with on a purely regional basis, it no longer makes sense to do that. It will not make sense to do that going forward. We see that the impact of climate change is occurring more rapidly in the Arctic than anywhere else on the planet. But it's not being caused by things happening in the Arctic. It's being caused by global things. We have the question of whether or not um, large-scale natural resources will be developed in the Arctic. There certainly are large-scale resources, but that will be determined in significant part by the global economy by world market prices, which are not being determined by or in the Arctic. Whether or not there's large scale shipping in the Northern Sea Route is likely to be determined by things happening on a global scale. The future of maritime commerce in general and the options in terms of alternative sea routes and so on. So the Arctic is whether we like it or not, linked in a very strong and powerful way to the rest of the world. That means we can't, the Arctic states can't simply ignore the rest of the world. You know, they, it may be perfectly legitimate to say that the Arctic Council should have only Arctic states as, quote, members, but it can't ignore the rest of the world. But a point I would really stress is that many other countries like the Chinese and the Japanese and the Koreans and the Germans and the French and the Brits and so on, all are articulating interests and in saying, well, we have legitimate interests in the Arctic, but if you think about the drivers of environmental change, the drivers of economic change, I think it's incredibly important to say to these countries, yes, perhaps we have interest but you also ought to acknowledge responsibility. And if you are willing to acknowledge responsibility in a sincere and significant and 
uh, operational way, then we might talk about a variety of mechanisms. And the mechanisms are the sort of technical, sort of formal devices that we create to uh, accomplish various sorts of purposes. And I think if we get the balance of interest and responsibility right, then we can start to talk about what are the right forms, what are the right mechanisms for accommodating or uh, acknowledging or accepting the concerns of these non-Arctic states. Yes, please. I'll just say very briefly that with respect to the observing system and the data sharing system, we're already seeing great cooperation between the Arctic states and the non-Arctic states. Non-Arctic states are taking uh, important roles, leadership roles. Um, the first polar data forum held in 2013 was hosted in Japan. So, I mean, that alone says that it's not about Arctic states versus non-Arctic states. It's about those states with an interest. And as Oren points out, that's, that's the world, essentially. Yes, please. My name is Alexey. I'm just an American standard German visitor. So, I have a question. If you're talking about... Thank you. If you're talking about... Arctic, we have to know what Murmansk, do you know this name of this city? Murmansk is the Arctic gateway, isn't it? Yeah? Gateway. Do you know, do you know something about Murmansk? Well, what is a huge city, about 300,000 inhabitants? Do you know something about um, Arctic uh, State University? Uh, do you have the same project, um, project with Murmansk government and uh, local business like Eriski, Niki, maybe Murmansk shipping company, and things like this. Uh, can you tell more about real life, about your projects with uh, Murmansk and with Arctic companies, and things like this? Thank you. In fact, provide the, uh, the on the ground uh, opportunity. To, to build, to implement uh, the types of development that are necessary. So in a sense, what we're looking at is how to take the investment that's anticipated over the next two decades and to translate it into sustainability across the 21st century. Now, you can't just do that automatically. So one framework that is being considered is that there are phases of development. So one phase of development is an anchor phase of development. The anchor phase of development has the purpose of coordination, cooperation, and consistency on a pan-Arctic basis. So if we have something like a search and rescue agreement or a marine pollution preparedness and response agreement, in order to implement it on a pan-Arctic basis, all of the nations have to be coordinated not just in signing an agreement, but in implementing the agreement. So one type of response is an emergency response system, a system that operates around the entire Arctic Ocean. It's not something that's limited to any one area. So one thought in terms of achieving sustainability is to go through phases. The first phase is an anchor phase. The next phase involves uh, the, the foundation. The foundation is more sub, is more regional, subnational levels, <coughs> sub, um, so areas like Murmans. In these areas, the foundation would be established where you would have services and you would have activities that would further support the the uh, types of uh, markets that would emerge. So the markets would be the next phase. The markets would involve shipping, would involve energy, would involve fishing. And so if you think of these three phases, they're not going to occur one after the other. They're all, they have to all start at the same time. And so right now, the investment that's effectively considered in the Arctic is largely focused on markets. But if we focus on markets and we don't prepare the Arctic to respond to those market activities, the Arctic will be a mess. And so in a sense, the anchor phase of investment and the, and the foundation phase of investment are infrastructure phases, whereas the market phase is the business phase. An analogy would be this building. 
if you think about this building, we didn't start with the floors, we didn't start with the rooms. They started with anchors into the ground. And the purpose of the anchors in the ground was to create stability for the foundation. And the foundation was poured, and on top of the foundation were the rooms. And so the idea is a similar sense in terms of how to mature the development in the Arctic that would have the greatest chance of balance, of achieving balance between environmental protection, societal well-being for the indigenous peoples, for the other residents, for the nations, as well as economic prosperity. So the challenge is one of balance. And to achieve that, it can't happen all in one big packet. The investment itself has to recognize that the Arctic itself lacks sufficient infrastructure to effectively implement the types of market activities that are anticipated. So I leave it to others to perhaps additionally respond. Well, that's another good question. Um, Elena raised the question of the relationship between Arctic states and non-Arctic states. You raised the question of the relationship between national governments and subnational units or subnational areas or regions, oblasts, okrus, counties, territories, states. We have the same sort of issue in the United States with the relationship between Alaska and the national government. And the fact of the matter is that there are some differences in interests between those who are responsible for decision making or policy making at the national level and those who are responsible for dealing with issues at the subnational level. It's not the purpose of science to choose sides regarding issues of that kind. It is not our role to, to say, it is our role to try to explore the nature of these relationships to determine whether there are actually opportunities for addressing these different needs and circumstances in a cooperative way. Um, so we think we as the science community might actually be able to identify a greater number of options and find some ways, some innovations, some ways it might not have been thought about in some of the more conflictual interactions that could help to um, minimize, not necessarily to eliminate, but to minimize some of these kinds of national government, subnational frictions that can, for understandable reasons, quite often become significant. Uh, yes, I also support my colleagues. I really need the relations between central power the regions, local powers, are very relevant to the Arctic and uh, the international law, for instance, provides some rules relating to the specific protection of coastal communities, uh, some rules for specific protection of rural areas whose inhabitants make their livelihood from, from the sea, which is, which is near them. But uh, generally, of course, it's outside this country national law, it's an issue of national legislation, <coughs> national policy. Uh, but uh, just uh, one uh, humble remark, both Murmansk, Markhangelsk region, Sakhaya Kutia, and other uh, northern regions are very, very active in the Council of Federation. They have the, uh, the Council on the Arctic, which is, uh, uh, which is the, the chairman, is the former president of Yakutia. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, the remarks from the movements of and other uh, northern regions, for instance, to the draft law on the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, were really very, very good, very important. And I might say that uh, they were taken seriously. I don't know whether the, the, the second draft <coughs> will be better than the first one, which was prepared by the government. But in any case, I think that this uh, input from northern regions are really very important. Other questions, please. Uh, scientific agreement from 2015, as far as I understood. Uh, could you name uh, a few projects that are being in operation right now or are in the 
next future will be uh, implemented, the most interesting one. And the second one is a little bit of topic. It is about uh, nuclear power. Will it substitute uh, fossil fuels uh, in future in European Union? Will it be a new alternative to alternative energy? Thank you. <laughs> Um, not a great specialist in nuclear power. So I cannot answer the uh, nuclear power question other than to say that as we explore other sources of energy, um, it makes demand on non renewable sources um, less attractive. So that's important, I think, to seek non renewable or to seek these alternative sources of energy from wind, from sun, from water, uh, wherever they happen to be, nuclear perhaps. Um, but there are, there are risks associated with nuclear as we, as we know. Um, your other question related to? The scientific projects. So scientific projects specifically relating to the Marine Oil Pollution Preparedness and Response Agreement from 2013. Uh, or no, like, uh, like uh, what projects are being uh, in operation right now or internationally? Some, something interesting, some big projects. Snucked? Yeah, yeah, so, in that region. But you were asked specifically the 2013 agreement? No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, this agreement. Maybe it gave some uh, new push to these projects or something new was uh, uh, started. The, the, the new agreement. The, the new agreement. The one that, one that was yeah. just signed in 2017. Yeah. In May of 2017. So um, perhaps there's a way of looking at both of your answers together. Um, in 1996, there was the Arctic Military Environmental Cooperation Program. So it and it was designed to look at uh, nuclear waste, largely off of uh, Russia in the in the ocean, and involved cooperation between the United States. Russia and England at the time. And that agreement um, was established at that point to um, basically retrieve nuclear waste that was in the ocean from the old uh, rods and so on and so forth. In terms of the agreement that was just signed uh, last month, the intention is to enhance Arctic scientific cooperation. So the agreement name was Agreement on Enhancing International Arctic Scientific Cooperation. Now, one of the things we've talked around as a, as a team here is what is science? And I would offer a definition that is not intended to break down barriers, but to look above in a, in a, in a more holistic sense, a broader sense. If you look at what science is, it's effectively the study of change. And so there's different ways of approaching change. There's natural sciences that study the ocean, the atmosphere, the biology, the geology. There's social sciences that study history or economics, measure trade, currency exchange, or even law that looks at precedence across time. Indigenous knowledge measures change differently, but the, the, the enhancement part really, and it goes to a lot of the questions, the enhancement part is taking the information that's collected by the study of change and applying it in ways that are helpful. So as a project, what we're interested in doing is introducing options. The options are distinct from recommendations. So recommendations involve advocacy, they involve agendas, and often they're introduced into decision-making environments where the decision-makers view those recommendations as intrusive. On the other hand, options, and we, were, we are explicit in terms of defining options as being without advocacy and being explicit that they can be used or ignored. So there's clearly no advocacy involved. By introducing options into the decision-making process, the decision-makers have more alternatives, more to work with in contributing to inform decision-making. So as, as a project, our interest is to contribute options 
that contribute to informed decision making. Now, the, the project as, a, as an activity, and I would suggest it is a, an emerging discussion, is not to look at data. So data is collected by observing systems, for example, and it's, it's remotely collected perhaps by satellites, for example. Not to look at data. Data is something that's cold. It doesn't necessarily have a purpose. But evidence implies for a decision, so for something. And so in terms of the types of decisions that are being made, arguably there are two types of decisions. One type of decision deals with built things, ports, ships, mobile fixed assets, communication systems, research systems, observing systems, things that require technical as well as financial capitalization in order to build. So that's on one type of decision. Where do you put the money and the, the, the technical elements in terms of building? The other types of decisions relate to governance mechanisms, policies, regulatory devices, agreements, treaties, even insurance. And so in a sense, as a project that we're involved with, is to think in terms of options, that contribute to informed decision making, particularly along the lines of infrastructure, built infrastructure, plus governance mechanisms, with the idea that the types of solutions that are necessary to solve the problems that we're identifying, the issues, the impacts, the resources, they require time scales that are not over political, over security time scales. They're not the immediate necessarily and only the immediate risks of political, economic, <coughs> or cultural instability that we're trying to respond to. These types of questions relate to responses over generations. And just in terms of what this project and what the, the scientific agreement really offers is perspective. Um, and just for perspective, for the, for the students in the room, your children, will be alive in the 22nd century. So just in terms of perspective, your children will be alive in the 22nd century, which means that you, as a parent, have responsibility to think across the 21st century. So part of the challenge that we collectively have is to extend the thinking from security timescales, which are the urgencies that governments traditionally have operated under, to thinking over sustainability timescales, which are across generations. It's not one or the other, it's a continuum. And the entire scientific community, the entire world, is effectively operating in this type of future where we're a globally interconnected civilization. The Arctic is a part of it, as Oren mentioned. It's not isolated, it's a part of it. And so the solutions that come from the Arctic have global relevance. Um, but I'd leave it to others to answer. Again, let me try to respond very specifically to your questions. Um, the first question about nuclear energy. I mean, none of us knows the answer to that question. And it's clearly going to be influenced fundamentally by not only economic and political considerations, but also issues of public attitude and perceptions and reactions to things. On the other hand, I think there's a very, very strong case to be made for the proposition that nuclear energy is not going to be the way in the future. If you look at what's happening in Germany today, if you look at what's happening in China today, if you look at what's happening in the United States today, it is not um, a picture which suggests that we're really going to make a big fundamental uh, choice um, around nuclear energy. Um, that would certainly be my guess. On your second question, uh, the 2017 agreement is two weeks old. And so, of course, we can't say this and this and that has happened as a result of the 2017 agreement. Um, however, I want to emphasize, uh, which perhaps hasn't been sufficiently clear, although Peter, I think, has uh, alluded to this, that there is already a lot of scientific cooperation going on with respect to Arctic issues. I mean, 
in certain areas, it's, it's very big, big kind of stuff. For example, take uh, oceanography, where you have uh, research cruises of, you know, the Polar Stern from Germany, or the Schwellang from China, or the Healy from the United States, or a counterpart from Canada. Every one of the cruises of those vessels have research packages on them which are ordinarily 20, 30, 40 different projects from five, six, seven, eight uh, countries. They're big time cooperative scientific projects. They are going to continue, no question. Peter is talking about the data side. They are already big time cooperation involving not only the Arctic states themselves, but the science community more international government. That will continue. I think an interesting response to your question is, is there a prospect that we might actually be able to launch some innovative research, perhaps justified or based on or energized by the creation of this new agreement? And I would think particularly some of the kinds of things that we as a group are striving to do, and whether you want to call it sustainability science or science that's no longer siloed into conventional disciplines or science that's based around a new kind of relationship between the scientific world and the policy world where we really start to think not only about delivering science that's done to the policymakers but engaging what we call end to end, engaging this policy community in framing the questions as well as delivering the answers. And I don't know whether this will be the case, but it strikes me that this new agreement could be seen as an opportunity in that regard to say, you know, here is something new. Why don't we take this as a basis for launching some, not, a, not to stop the existing things, which are obviously going to continue and are important, but launching some new kinds of science. Maybe this is an opportunity to do so. Just to wrap up briefly on that, if you look at uh, organizations like the International Arctic Science Committee or the Arctic Council Working Groups, um, there are already many different international initiatives going on, um, and they range from looking at you know permafrost, oceans, to social sciences, and so on. Um, so I won't go into the details there, but if you go to their websites, you can see all kinds of different things. But you hit on a really important point, which is, Although we're looking at international scientific cooperation, most of the science is funded at a national or subnational level. So it's still a challenge to do truly international work where all of the bodies are getting together and planning their research together, implementing it together, um, with the exception of the Belmont Forum that we're funded under. I'm not aware of uh, many other sort of consistent programs. So that's something I'm hoping agreements like this can really help to move us forward on, and there's some discussions going on amongst funders. Um, to, to sort of look at that because it can be a challenge to really do a good international science if you're being funded you know opportunistically by individual governments uh, you know it's it's working at some level now but I don't think it's optimal other questions please yes First of all, I would like to thank you for coming here. It's a very opportunity to see some distinguished guests in Moscow. Uh, so I have two questions. The first one, I had a chance to ask to a panel consisting of uh, Canadian people uh, a couple of years ago. So how would you evaluate the work of the Council, and particularly uh, working groups, and especially uh, working group on sustainable development? And the second question, um, uh, I had a discussion with an NSF representative concerning uh, research infrastructure in Washington. And uh, I know that in conjunction with the uh, Arctic Council meeting in Fairbanks, there was an Arctic broad broadband forum. So they are building uh, optic fiber around uh, Alaskan coast. Uh, so what kind of infrastructure do we need in the Arctic? I think we probably all would need to take a bite out of those questions. Um, in terms of, of infrastructure um, and the effectiveness <coughs> of the Arctic Council, 
Um, the Sustainable Development Working Group is one of the six working groups. And uh, the Arctic Council, when it was established under the Ottawa Declaration in 1996, said that sustainable development was a common Arctic issue. In one way or another, all six of the working groups are focusing on sustainable development. So while there may be one working group called the Sustainable Development Working Group, in effect, all of them are contributing to various elements of sustainable development. The value of the Arctic Council, I would say, is that it has promoted cooperation among the Arctic states, even evolving to the point where we now have this new agreement talking about enhancing cooperation. So the, in a sense, the Arctic Council has provided a very important high-level forum to, for the scientific community to build common interests, to think in, in not only to evolve beyond thinking only and specifically in terms of sustainable development, but to think in terms of peace and stability of the region. Um, in terms of, of basic <coughs> research funding by the National Science Foundation and research infrastructure. There was a very interesting paper that came out in Science uh, in March of this year. In the United States, the funding for basic research is now larger in the private sector than it is from the U.S. government. That has a number of implications. It has implications because transformative research, the things that are disruptive in terms of the economics of the world, come from industry. It has implications in terms of foreign relations because these industries are multinational. And so, in a sense, the, there is a, a, a change that is happening in terms of basic research, not research and development, but basic research, the budgets in industry in the United States, the private sector, is larger than from the government. And that's, that's significant in terms of infrastructure. In terms of the infrastructure for the Arctic as a region, um, the earlier question and response was, I don't think it's going to happen all at once. I think there are phases. Um, the phases would include things like communication systems. The communication systems was the first response came out of the Arctic Economic Council. So the Arctic Council evolved with affiliated organizations, bodies, I gather they're not subsidiary, but affiliated. Um, one is the Arctic Economic Council that came out of the Arctic Council in 2014. And under the US chairmanship, there was the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. And these three bodies operate transition in concert with each other. So every time there's a two, every two years, they move to another, they rotate to another of the Arctic states. In thinking about infrastructure, in a sense, you've got three different perspectives and activities in the Arctic. The Arctic Economic Council arguably could think in terms of investment and implementation. The Arctic Coast Guard Forum could think in terms of regulatory responses. The Arctic Council could think in terms of knowledge and and assessments and reports, which has been its bread and butter through the various working groups. So in addition, there are details like observing systems that are necessary for safe shipping, for meteorology in the region. There's need for communication systems. There's need for collecting all this information and managing it through information systems. In addition, the research, the, the infrastructure is going to have to have the various types of capacity to respond to the markets that emerge, not only for the development and servicing the markets, but the prevention of emergencies or the response to emergencies. So these are going to be ports and ships, emergency response systems. So in a sense, um, just by analogy, in 1903, there was a convention in the United States that was called the National and International Roads Convention. And this convention recognized that there were trucks and cars with rubber tires. 
and these trucks and cars with rubber tires at the beginning of the 20th century were bouncing along roads with potholes and mud and so on. And so the notion came that they needed to have paved roads for this growing fleet of cars and trucks with rubber tires. And this convention, this National and International Roads Convention, basically came up with the concept that these roads are going to have to be built not between big cities like New York and Chicago, or, but they were going to have to be built across continents. And so it set in motion the development of infrastructure, of a road system of infrastructure that operated across continents. And at the time, Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president or previous president, noted that all great nations build good roads. So the Arctic is just at that point. We're just evolving the tired vehicles. We don't have the roads in place. So in a sense, we're on a journey to build the roads that allow for these vehicles, the operations, the markets to mature in ways that are safe and secure and profitable, that are benefiting the residents of the region, the non-residents of the region. But this infrastructure is going to take time. And the time, in effect, is analogous to public works. So when you think of things like dams, think of things like roads, think of things like electricity grids or communication systems, often these take decades to implement, to actually build. And so the time frame of constructing these public goods is likely to take decades to construct. And that's the reason that it's necessary to begin to think across the 21st century, not arbitrary time frames like 2030 or 2050, but to think across generations. As uh, all of you know, we've just celebrated 20 years of the Arctic Council, and there have been a whole series of meetings trying to assess where we are and where we're going in the future. I would simply echo Paul's uh, uh, comment that it takes time. Now, sometimes you do get some concrete results. For example, the Arctic spatial data infrastructure is structure which involves all of the eight Arctic states. And the idea is to use location in order to tie all kinds of information using common standards and common specifications together. So in the event of an environmental disaster, it will affect all of the Pan-Arctic states. If we have a common database based on, on location in order to respond to that, this will go a long way towards making things happen. Now the Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure was first mooted by Canada during the International Polar Year. It took several years of negotiation before we actually got going, but we're now well on the way to have an implemented structure which will be of utility and use, uh, which will be of utility to science and to decision makers across all eight Arctic nations. Now that is an initiative of the Arctic Council and it's, to me, a success story. Now the Arctic Council, I think, is doing necessary things, but perhaps not sufficient things. There are many more things that have to be done, but an important step forward <coughs> has been taken and I think it's something that we can build on for the future. Let me just say a few words on the Arctic Council issue. Um, I spent a fairly significant chunk of my professional career trying to answer your questions. In fact, it's a little difficult to summarize in a few sentences. But let me make a couple of observations. One is that the Arctic Council has proven to be more effective and significant than most of us who are present at the creation anticipated. The second is that still many people have an inappropriate conception of what, how to think about the effectiveness of the Arctic Council. And they think about this more in kind of 
regulatory terms. They don't think so much about the kinds of contributions that Fraser was mentioning. So the second point is it's, it's very important to think in a somewhat um, clear way about what are the nature of the contributions that this organization, this entity, can um, make, and how do we evaluate its performance in those terms. A third comment that's um, perhaps relevant is that there is a lot of um, consciousness about the question of trying to reflect on the performance of the African Council and to think about where to go in the future. Uh, there has been a discussion about this um, issue during the U.S. chairmanship. Uh, it's specifically passed on to the Finnish chairmanship, which has agreed to think about this question. And my colleagues in the Finnish chairmanship initiative say they fully intend to pass this issue further on to the Icelandic chairmanship that will follow the Finnish chairmanship. So no, solution, no conclusions overnight, but a very real and I think constructive process of reflecting on this very question. With regard to the Sustainable Development Working Group that you specifically mentioned, um, which I've been very close to over the years. So I would say it's probably the working group of the Arctic Council that has had the hardest time trying to um, identify clearly and explicitly what the nature of its mission is. Um, that's probably not the fault of the working group itself, but it has to do with the nature of sustainable development as a concept being a difficult one to wrap our arms around in a clear and straightforward way um, relative to some of the kinds of things that other working groups have done. So I don't mean this to be a criticism of particular people or efforts, but it's been a tough job to get the Sustainable Development Working Group on a kind of a clear foundation well-defined sense of its uh, function and mission. Perhaps we'll take one last question. My phone is over there. Do you have a question over there? There's a question back here. Um, my name is Irina. I am professor of Higher School of Economics in Moscow. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for a very interesting discussion about the problems of Arctic zone. And uh, I may say that our institute are closely connected with the development of Arctic zone in Russia, and uh, not only in Russia. And now I, want, I would like to present you a very interesting book. <laughs> This is the result of our work uh, with Norway Institute. And this book is devoted to the problem of uh, development of Russia and sustainable, sustainable development of Russia. Thank you. This is in Russian language. Say back. What point is that? Can I ask you to sign this so it would only be appropriate? <laughs> uh, after, of course. But do you have a question for us? And my question is, uh, what what do you think about the development of the Russian cities in Arctic? Because now we have 17 cities, and population of the cities now uh, greatly decreased. And at the same time, uh, in program of development of Russian Arctic, uh, these cities uh, must be uh, one of the point of development of Russian Arctic. What do you think about Russian cities in Arctic? Thank you. I'll leave it to a Russian expert. <laughs> well, I could say a few words and then others uh, uh, as well. First of all, let me say that um, um, I have visited the Paris School of Economics and have a great deal of respect for what is going on at your 
Institute. So um, I think it's a very strong uh, organization. Uh, the answer, I think, to your question might be a disappointing one, because I think the answer is that it's likely to be quite different in different cities. I don't think there's going to be uh, sort of a uniform um, situation. So let us take a few um, examples. I mean, so if we look at Mormonsk, if we look at Pantimansisk, if we look at Archangels, if we look at um, Chiktivar, if we look at um, um, Norilsk, for example, these are cities, each of which is based on a rather significantly different kind of fundamental social and economic, um, even, even um, biophysical uh, situation. Some of them, I mean, the fate of um, Siktivar is going to be very much tied up with the fate of the oil and gas industry. No question about it. The fate of Norilsk is going to be tied up with the fate of Norilsk nickel. No question about it. The fate of Murmansk is going to be very tied up with um, what happens to those sort of larger defense, naval, security um, complex. Um, so I think it's just very hard to um, kind of see any common keys. Um, but maybe others would have some thoughts about that. I don't know a great deal in detail about your work, <coughs> but uh, one of the things I would observe comes from what is happening in Canada. Part of our problem is we have many, many institutions, agencies, and organizations working on the Arctic. Unfortunately, the degree of communication between and among them is not great enough, and we are looking at the creation of uh, an Arctic science data infrastructure or information infrastructure in order to improve that situation. Now, I do not know what the Russian situation is, but perhaps you have some of the same challenges as we do of getting people to interact. But one thing I can say for certain is the degree of cooperation between Canada and Russia on these issues needs to be improved. Uh, like Fraser, I'm not an expert in that area, but I, I work with some people who are, and I think this points to a larger issue as well of perceptions of the Arctic. Um, it's very easy for the general population, I know in Canada and the US where I work, to think of the Arctic as, as this undiscovered territory, the terra incognita. Yes, there are a few small villages there, there are polar bears and things that I don't need to see, need to go see on a cruise ship. But they're forgetting that there are now large cities there, particularly in Russia, and there are large communities elsewhere in the Arctic. So the issues we're facing are not simply issues of the small community or issues of, of science. There are issues that are being faced by communities in the South as well, and there needs to be that connection. Um, my career started working with municipalities, and I still think about some of those things that I did there when I work in the North as well. So I think along the lines of what Fraser's alluded to is we need to see a better connection and not put the Arctic into that sort of box that is just a, a place for tourists and a place for northern residents that we don't know much about. So on, on behalf of the Pan-Arctic Options Project, the team members that are here, I would like to thank the American Center, I'd like to thank the U.S. Embassy, and I'd like to thank the audience for the interesting, engaging questions. Um, and I'd like to leave this discussion with hope and inspiration. I think the Arctic is a region of the planet where nations are cooperating, where there is scientific exchange like this one, and it is a region that is looking toward the future. So thank you very much.